So greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining this uh, seminar, uh, basically a physical seminar in Niti Aayog and uh, simultaneously uh, live casted um, uh, uh, with, with many people joining in across the world. Uh, so we are really delighted to have uh, Dr. Deepak Rajagopal, so who is uh, uh, both a long-time friend and collaborator with whom I have, have uh, done some uh, work before. Um, and uh, this seminar is uh, a part of uh, the, the series of uh, seminars, webinars, workshops, and so on that we are doing at the uh, Tate & Commerce Vertical at Niti Ayo, which uh, aim at uh, promoting trade policy research and analytics in uh, India. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we record all these seminars and uh, uh, upload them on YouTube. So they're also uh, available for the entire world. So publicly available. Uh, so in this series, we are really, really happy to host uh, uh, Dr. Deepak Rajagopal, who is uh, an associate professor from uh, Institute for uh, Sustainability in, in um, University of uh, California, Los Angeles. And uh, simultaneously, he's also affiliated with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And uh, so he um, did his uh, bachelor's from IIT Madras in, I think, in mechanical engineering. And then he went on to do a master's in engineering and then a PhD in uh, uh, in an interdisciplinary area involving economics, sustainability, and, uh, and also engineering. So uh, from UC Berkeley um, and uh, from a very, um, I think his advisor is very well-known uh, uh, researcher named Dr. Zilberman, David Zilberman, who is very well known in this area. Uh, and uh, Dr. Raj, uh, Deepak Rajagopal has also worked uh, extensively in the areas of broadly the areas of uh, energy, environment, sustainability, transportation, you know, uh, uh, more recently in uh, electric mobility, you know, electric vehicles, and so on. And he has worked on uh, issues that concern the entire world uh, globally but also he has a specific interest on india he has done a lot of work on on, on india as well um uh, uh, currently he's with ucla and he also was at uh, indiana university bloomington for for some time and uh, he was uh, in the department of uh, public administration if you remember well and um, so uh, it's it's really nice to have uh, have you here uh, deepak and uh, uh, he's going to talk about a topic that's uh, of interest to uh, many colleagues in uh, Niti Aayog here, but also government of India in general and, and uh, uh, people working on India uh, in general as well. Um, it pertains to the electric vehicles. Uh, we, have, we, we discuss a lot on the, the technological aspects there and the policy aspects there. Uh, but uh, he's going to lay out uh, uh, some ideas, some thoughts, and some analysis, focusing on the economic impact of economic implications of electric vehicles, and uh, particularly the trade implications. Since you know uh, our interest is mainly trade, so trade and economic implications of electric vehicles in India. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you, uh, Deepak, and uh, the floor is yours now, and uh, you can. Uh, uh, present this and after you finish we can have some questions and sure. uh, conclude so the floor is yours thank you thank you very much once again for coming here thank you thank you uh thank you thank you badri for that uh, wonderful introduction uh and also hosting this talk uh it's a great pleasure to be uh, uh be back in delhi back in india after uh last two three years uh I used to be a frequent visitor uh and so it's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to also present um uh, so uh, can we just have the presentation up there? Uh, yeah, what to do and I'll see how this works. We're in presentation mode and, okay, it works. Uh, so yeah, um, I have, uh, about me, I think uh, Badri gave a wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm, um, I know this is uh, uh, mainly hosted in the trade uh, vertical. Uh, I'm not a trade economist. Uh, I, I wanna get that right off the, out of the bat. Um, I, yeah, to an engineer, I sound very much like an economist. To an economist, I sound like an engineer. So I'm, I'm sort of neither perfectly. I like to think of myself a little bit of both. Um, and uh, yeah, so I come at it, this topic, uh, having worked for the last two, three years on electric vehicles and on policies in India. 
uh, from an interdisciplinary perspective and uh, mainly from an energy perspective. Um, but the motivation for this work is that, um, you know, electric vehicles, obviously energy is a huge, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, has a huge footprint on, 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 on trade. I'll just have some statistics. Uh, so I'll try to um, say something about, you know, the imports uh, implications and I don't have, uh, so let me just say why sort of this is interesting. Uh, you know, broadly there are some opportunities and challenges associated with the EV transition. The opportunities are that, you know, they potentially offer cost savings. It's, it's cheaper to operate them over the life. They may be, uh, but the challenge is it's costlier upfront. Uh, the pollution reduction is a very big important factor. Uh, even with uh, uh, a coal intensive uh, energy mix like India, which has still a substantial amount of coal, uh, there are clear greenhouse gas benefits. It may not be cost effective in terms of how much greenhouse gas you're reducing per extra cost. Uh, but if you're on a life cycle basis, actually, since you have a lower life cycle cost and reducing emissions, it's actually a win-win in the long run. But in the in the near term, it might be higher upfront cost. So even with, I want to be clear that even with with a dirtier grid, even if with coal in the mix, 60-70% coal, you get greenhouse gas benefits. Um, energy imports is a very big uh, potential benefit. As, uh, that's one thing that drew me to this uh, topic. Um, and that there are other benefits like coordination with renewable energy generation. If you can time it right, you can actually get advantages uh, from uh, having to balance the grid. Um, and the challenges are that, you know, battery cells are imported. So are we trading energy and energy imports for battery imports is a question. Um, there is some concern that uh, electric vehicles have far fewer parts and they require less maintenance. And so they might entail uh, lower jobs per vehicle kilometer driven. So I want to put some, um, so some prior work, it's not really, again, again, I want to be very uh, careful here that, you know, uh, this is again, all in interdisciplinary sort of outlets. My work tries to bring together engineering, economic, environmental, sustainability perspective together. So a lot of these is in sort of general interest journals, uh, like environmental research, lectures, nature, energy, transportation research. And we have done some work looking at um, cars, uh, trains, uh, um, um, <clears throat> the, uh, converting diesel trains to electric trains, uh, battery electric trains, not the catenary wire trains, slightly different topic, and so on. Um, okay, so the motivation essentially to potentially understand the broad potential implications of transition to EVs um, for life cycle cost, net energy imports, government revenues, uh, employment, and pollution under current conditions. So, and uh, I want to under, look at a few policy options. I think one of the, the four, and look at four potential policy and touch upon what they might mean. Uh, one of the things that might be of interest to this group is the one at the bottom. Uh, of, I also want to be very careful because I know I'm not a trade expert. So, but this is an idea I'm extending from trading of environmental permits to trading of import permits. So let, we'll talk about it in the end. Maybe that's probably the most exciting thing for the trade people here. Um, uh, so we'll see, uh, and I would welcome some criticism there because I'm not a trade economist. So, so the main approach is what I want to do it is uh, I want to do an incre incremental cost of electric vehicles uh, relative to internal combustion cost of internal cost of combustion vehicles. Um, I'll use current information on cost, import content, taxes, tariffs, subsidies, jobs intensity, which comes from annual survey of industries. I want to analyze a scenario in which. 10% new auto sales as electric vehicles and compare the outcomes for a one-to-one -one replacement. So if 10% if of new cars are EVs and you're selling 10% less uh, petrol or diesel vehicles. Um, and then perform some sensitivity analysis to key inputs and discuss potential options. So I want, there's a lot of caveats I want to get uh, out there. One is that it's a linear analysis. Uh, it assumes fixed prices. Uh, so it's sort of a Leon TF analysis in some sense. Um, there's no normative welfare implications. I don't have a theoretical model from which, and there's no welfare economic model from which I start and try to derive the optimal conditions. There's no such thing there. It's, um, at be I think it, and I want to be very honest, what it does, it, it actually derives some hypothesis for further investigation. Uh, its strength is it's very detailed. I'll try to show that it's, it's very detailed bottom up cost estimation. Um, it's also more heavy on accounting, uh, detailed accounting as opposed to, uh, no, very heavy on theory or sophisticated modeling. 
And I know that sounds like a little bit of a bummer, but I think um, sometimes um, as important as, you know, um, uh, we need some sophisticated modeling to look at the long run implications where, you know, uh, we have some sort of a structural model. Um, I think for me, the transition is extremely important. Uh, and uh, the accounting actually provides a very good starting point to see what the implications are. A model like this is very useful to understand how what's the structure of the linkages today. Um, and the short run, I think a linear assumption is not bad. It, it, it sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, transparently tells you what's, you know, what can happen. Um, so it, it, I, I see some value uh, in, in detailed accounting um, uh, as, a, as a good starting point, even if it is sort of like, you know, it doesn't have too much long run implications because, you know, we are assuming a lot of things are fixed and input output coefficients are fixed and all these things we know can change. And the purpose of policy is actually to change these coefficients. Uh, the input output coefficients are resume as fixed. The aim of policy is to change them. Uh, so. So that's the sort of the caveats. Um, so just to uh, so bear with me while I sort of walk you through some of the things on electric vehicles, and uh, I sort of so this is snagged from Automotive News Europe. Uh, I was trying to see you know what is gained and what is lost, and this seemed like an excellent graphic of uh, what is lost in uh, when we switch from a a, a, um, a petrol vehicle to the uh, to a, or a diesel vehicle to or even a natural gas vehicle to an electric vehicle and so this picture shows like you know uh, the transmission unit the powertrain which refers to the transmission system um, and the engine components largely but then also there is the cooling system the engine cooling system there is some of the exhaust system and the fuel fuel system components are lost um, I have some numbers on what these things cost uh, it's not very easy to get and a lot of this is not easy to find information if you're doing as a doing it as a researcher. A lot of the theoretical papers, uh, you know, assume away a lot of these things. And so, partly what I'm trying to do is shed some light that people that do modeling can sort of incorporate in more detail as you do more sophisticated models. Uh, so that's lost, and what is gained is that's replaced by the battery pack. Uh, that is replaced by the battery pack. There is a charging port. Oh, it's very sensitive here. Uh, this comes and goes inside. Okay. Anyway, um, there is the. I don't know. It doesn't show on the screen. <laughs> it's interesting. It's not showing on the screen. Just the the point. That's okay. That's fine. So initially, there you see what I'm pointing at is uh, the inverter and the power control, the powertrain management. E the electric motor, the battery pack, charging port, and high voltage cable, these are the new components. So this is going to be an opportunity for a lot of new components to be added and a lot of components to be replaced. Um, so just in terms of numbers, um, uh, oh, this, sorry. Okay. Um, what does it mean in terms of the cost of the car? Uh, because I know India is a very huge auto uh, producer, automaker, auto exporter, we import some. The burden of auto, the, so how much we import is about 15% of the value added in a car, I, I believe is imported. We saw this number from CN, uh, Society of um, Automotive Institute, or some SEM. Um, I think 15 to 20% of our uh, total auto uh, GDP is, uh, or auto sales is imports. Um, so, if you look at the cost of a car, this is from the US, it's a bit dated, so just go by the percentages. Uh, the powertrain, which we are going to eliminate, uh, accounts for about 25%, uh, right in the middle of the screen there. The chassis, the HVAC system, the interior, the body, those are common. So let's say about 25% is the value of the car that is lost. Okay. Um, so here is an uh, assumption. This is a breakdown. So if you look at the ICE internal combustion engine vehicle, I assume a generic car at, that sells for 10 lakhs. Uh, the commas are shown in millions, so about 10 lakhs. If you take out the GST, which is the 28% GST plus a 17% CES on anything above or 15% CES above a uh, certain price range, eight or nine lakhs, if it goes into the luxury segment, uh, if you put on a, uh, that size of car and you take away the dealer margin, you take away the uh, OEM margin, so a dealer margin of 5% and OEM margin of 9% or 10%, you get down to what it 
takes to manufacture the car that comes to around 6 lakhs so if in a, in a in a 10 lakh showroom price around 6 lakhs or maybe give or take some if you say the powertrain cost is 20 percent that's around 120 lakhs worth of components so the non powertrain components i assume is like around 480 lakhs or 450 lakhs of give or take um, so just one detour on the petrol price um, uh, the other important assumption here uh, so if, if today the price is around 100 rupees, uh, the share of all taxes, excise, VAT, uh, etc., uh, comes to around 50%. Uh, and the remaining is 50% is the cost of crude oil, the dealer margin, transport, refining costs, ex everything is remaining 50%. So the cost of excise, which goes to this, and VAT is 50%, so 50 rupees. So if you actually, you know, like take the GHG emissions intensity of petrol uh, at, at 3425 uh, grams of carbon dioxide, and you actually say if all of that taxes is not an excise or a VAT, but let's pretend all of that is a, uh, is a carbon tax, what would that mean for the carbon price? What is an implicit carbon price? If all the tax, the 50 rupees per liter is entirely for carbon, then it, assume, then it says we are valuing carbon at $200 a ton. That's 194 I put there. That's a pretty hefty price. Of course, all the tax, none of the taxes is for carbon. It's it's for government revenue collection. Um, so, so what does it mean? If you slap on top of this a fifty rupees per ton carbon tax, that will raise the price of petrol by fifteen rupees. It's see, it's 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 a lot, but seems like given how prices are trending, it's not much. So just to put that in perspective, what that means in terms of what we are paying. So this again, for, uh, for from an imports perspective, uh, some snippets of what might be of interest to the trade people. So if you look at the retail price of petrol, it's 100 rupees. The share of taxes is 50%. In the remaining 50 rupees, actually, if you look at the cost of crude oil today, it's 100 rupees a, a barrel, and you and you get around so there is 42 gallons in a barrel, or which is 42 times 3.785 liters something of the order of 150 liters and you see, see what is the cost of uh, crude oil uh, assume all of it that is gasoline is an assumption roughly 30 to 35 percent uh, so 30 30 35 rupees in 100 rupees is the cost of crude oil remaining 65 is essentially taxes plus all the other stuff uh, refining transportation freight and all that margins we import 80 percent of our crude today uh, so essentially if you take the 100 rupees uh, 80 times 80 percent times 35 percent is essentially 30 percent but 30 percent 30 rupees in 100 rupees is simply money to pay the crude oil imports so 30 percent is is just direct transfer to uh foreign uh oil exporters okay so i think that's very interesting so here is the it is from a, a statistic on petroleum and uh, the apologies for the small font uh this is from a pub publicly a lot of this is from public information from this is from statista um, the, the right on the top is, is, is essentially, oh, sorry, is uh, crude oil, which is about 20% of all our imports, okay? Um, just to show how important it is to us. <clears throat> so it's 20% of imports. I'll, I'll share some statistics on the taxes, how important it is to our uh, um, revenue collection. I thought I had the picture. So uh, excise taxes, the union, uh, so excise taxes on petrol uh, and all oil products is 12% of India's uh, government revenues, 12%. And 95% of that is oil products. So, 20, so excise duty is 12% of government revenues. Out of that, 95% is excise duty on oil products. All right. Um, and out of that 95%, I think a large sh share is oil products. Our coal is a really small portion of our collection. And coal, they're actually collected through a GST. It's not, it's not part of the union excise duty. Uh, it's, it's part under GST, oil is not so. Okay, so that's some context on oil. Uh, again, I'm, right now what I'm giving you is all the assumptions that go into the model uh, to calculate the import, import uh, uh, benefits and import costs and jobs and so on. So it's all a lot of background. I want to be very transparent on the numbers I'm using. Um, so the battery price breakdown. So this is a uh, if you if you take a 22 kilowatt hour electric vehicle battery pack, 50% is the cost of the cells. Uh, so I think the mouse is not there, but the right half, the right half of the pie in blue is the cell. So if you take a, there is cells is like the just the, the cells that go into this or, or the individual uh, cells. You put that together to make a module. Uh, about a certain number of cells and then you collect these modules and make them into a pack 
and the pack is then put together with power electronics, cooling system, internal cell structure support, etc., battery management system, and so on. All of that is the rest, and then margin and warranty. So 50% of if so if you, if the battery pack costs $150 a kilowatt hour, about 50% is the uh, is the cost of the cells. Remaining 50 is so we import that today. In India, we don't make the cells. So with Make in India, with pro the production linked intense incentive scheme, the Atma Nirbhar, all those schemes are all trying to actually uh, make that 50% be made in India. But right now it's imported. All we do is the remaining. So we do a substantial value addition in, in domestic. So it's like 50% we are, we are actually domestically adding right now. Um, <clears throat> so we look at what these 50, replacing these 50% through imports means, uh, through, through domestic production means for the cost. And so on. So how do we how do I build up the price of the electric vehicle? So if just for reference, I assumed one, 10 lakhs for the for the price of the petrol car. I just start with that and back calculate what is the cost of the uh, components. Here I start with the battery and go up to compute the cost of the electric car. I don't go by the market price of the car, but it comes out close actually. So I start with an international battery price of one fifty dollars a kilowatt hour. Um, it's possible our domestic manufacturers pays, uh, face a higher price. Uh, so we'll look at that. So the import content of the battery pack is 50%, just based on what I showed you, because it's cells that we import. There is a 5% tariff on battery components. Uh, there are additional non-battery components in a vehicle. Okay, That's around 112,000. That is all the other thing, the electric motor. You need an electric motor. Uh, you need some of the other things that I showed you. Um, uh, so I, there is a detailed spreadsheet. So this is again, I also want to say as an academic, I'm always like to present stuff which I've published so that I, have, I know that it's been approved by my peers and it's gone through peer review. This is still just freshly finished. I haven't written it up as a paper. I, I hope to submit it to peer review, but when I do submit it, it will all these spreadsheets will be transparent and it will, you know, uh, so, um, so that just a ca another caveat out there, but I have, I, I think the numbers tick off and there is no sophisticated modeling. It's just in the numbers. And so, so long as I'm transparent, I think I'm okay. Um, <clears throat> so the battery components are around a hundred. So one lakh, uh, 10, uh, one lakh and 10,000. So I'm, I'm, um, uh, so I'm taking the price of the battery. I'm going to multiply it by how much battery you need in the vehicle. That's 30 kilowatt hours to get a 200 kilometer range. If you want 250, 300, it'll be a little bit more. So for a 200 kilometer range, you need 30 kilowatt hours of battery. I assume a life of eight years based on how much you drive it. We can talk about that uh, if you're interested. Uh, I made very reasonable conservative assumptions to, so that it, it looks as conservative as possible. Uh, so the, the valve, and then I assume that you replace the battery once in the life of the car and I assume that in five years time, we will start making the batteries in India. So the replacement battery is entirely domestically made. So there isn't a foreign component there, but there will be a premium uh, for it. So that's so, I, you, so the battery alone adds 450 lakhs to the cost of the car. And then on top of that, there is the additional component, which is 112 lakhs. So I add the two, I get 576 lakhs or 5.76, uh, 576 lakhs, so 576,000 if you're a non-Indian audience listening to this in, uh, so 576,000 rupees. Um, so, and then, on to, and, and to that, I take the 576,765, I put the dealer margin, I use the same as the ICE, uh, internal combustion engine, I put the GST of only 5%, and then I put a, uh, I put a, a five, uh, OEM profit, uh, all, and then all of that it comes to, um, uh, so that's before OEM profitability. I get to about 10 lakhs, and then I put, um, sorry, 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 the 576,000 plus there is the common portion, the tires, the wheels, the chassis, the, that is 400,000. So that those two add up to 10 lakhs. So 576,000 plus that adds to 10 lakhs. Now I put profitability, GST, margin, etc. It comes to 13 lakhs. So 3 lakhs more than a car. So it's sort of, you know, it's like reasonable. Uh, and so it's not cheaper. It's costlier by 3 lakhs after the GST discount. And I think that's a reasonable assumption. Okay, uh, last bit of information, jobs intensity. So um, I look at the annual survey of industries. I look at these sectors. Crude oil, refined products, ice components, ice maintenance, EV components, coal, pet oil. I look at uh, Atmanirbhar, solar panels. If we charge, if we charge our cars with solar panels made in India, instead of and what if we charge it with coal, uh, and then batteries. So I use those numbers. 
Okay, from that, for every rupee of car component, I get these jobs numbers. Uh, on like, and this is my assumption on 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 greenhouse gases, and then on sales. Finally, we sell about three uh, hundred three million cars, so that is thirty lakhs of cars every year. I assume ten percent is going to be electric. Some other assumptions before I dive into the results. Um, so the battery cost is 150. The battery life is 1500 cycles till 80% max charge. Uh, the cost of a 50 kilowatt fast charger is 7.5 lakhs. Um, if somebody has a better number, I can use that. Electricity price is 6.5 rupees per unit, which is per kilowatt hour. EV maintenance. One assumption I make is EVs have less maintenance. You don't need to do oil change. You don't need to do oil filter. You don't need to do a lot of things. You don't. The brakes last longer because you do regenerative braking. Uh, there isn't transmission, there is no transmission fluid, it's actually cheaper to maintain. So I, I put a 50% maintenance cost. Of, of I, and then I put a 30% premium for domestically made batteries. Uh, a discount rate of 10%, the life of the vehicle is 5 lakh kilometers, and the carbon cost is 50 rupees or $50 a ton. So that concludes my assumptions uh, on, yeah, on internal combustion engine, on taxes, on pollution, on batteries, on imports. What I'm going to do now, is I'm going to just assemble all this. It's a linear analysis. There is no fancy model. There is no fancy behavioral assumptions. It's just simple extrapolation linearly. Okay, uh, that's both the strength and the weakness of this model. So if you do that, and if you trust that I've done the arithmetic correctly, um, the results. What is the difference in the life cycle cost of ownership of the car? Uh, the upfront cost is higher by three lakhs, two eighty-five, two hundred eighty-five thousand. Uh, on a per kilometer basis, it's one rupee costlier per kilometer, uh, uh, one rupee costlier in upfront cost. So if you take the extra cost and you divide it by how much you drive, it's one rupee po more, more per kilometer upfront. But and but the fuel cost is two rupees and 26 paisa less per kilometer because it's more fuel efficient. And with the electricity price, even if you do an electricity price of 10 rupees, you will get savings. It's only one rupee and fifty cents, uh, one rupee and fifty pence and less. Maintenance cost is cheaper by one point five. So the life cycle cost of uh, comes to cheaper by two rupees and seventy pence per kilometer. So that's where you get a lot of the savings. So you pay more per kilometer to buy, but you get two and a half times more savings per kilometer on a life cycle basis. Of course, you recover it over the life. On the okay, how does it break down the total cost of ownership? It's 13 per kilometer. The uh, petrol car costs 13 rupees and 42 paisa. Um, out of that, the vehicle is 30%, the fuel is 50%, and the maintenance is 22%. And if you take the petrol price, and in that, you see how much of that is imports, 18% is the share of imports. So if you're doing trade models, you can use that as an import share, 0.18%, uh, sorry, uh, 18% is that share. If you now go to the electric vehicle, the total cost of ownership is almost half. Out of that, 65% is in the vehicle. Uh, the charging infrastructure is actually doesn't come out very costly. It's only 1% over the life. Electricity cost is 13%. So whereas fuel was 50%, for ICE, fuel is only 13% of the lifetime cost. Um, so all the action is in the batteries. Maintenance cost is 20%. But interestingly, the import share of electric vehicles is 16%. So on import share, it's the same. But in absolute terms, it's less because your, 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 the life cycle cost is almost half. So I'll show some numbers on imports. So this is a pretty busy chart. So uh, what I do here is I, I show two sets of results. For driving 100 kilometers a day and driving 200 kilometers. And this is if I, one thing I'm really, my contribution I think in this is to highlight why policy needs to focus on the vehicles that drive are driven the most. All the benefits come from targeting better. So targeting from a policy perspective, we want to target policies on who gives the most benefits. In this case, the, you maximize the benefits when you target the high usage vehicles because you're saving on fuel. It's very simple. There is no need for any fancy uh, mathematics here. The more you drive, the more benefits you get. So the more you displace the heavily driven vehicles, the more benefits you get. So this is showing a sensitivity of the benefits of total annualized cost. On the left, I have pollution without pollution. And then I internalize the greenhouse gas benefits at $50 a ton. 
That's the second row. Annualized total imports. I divide the all the savings into an annualized using the discount rate. Annualized government revenues in taxes and tariffs and annualized total jobs. So I have pollution. The life, so I have five outcomes, five variables. Uh, total cost, life cycle without pollution, with pollution, imports, revenues, and jobs, which are five things that policymakers care about. Um, it's showing uh, for the, you can ignore the ice column and the EV column. Just focus on the EV minus ice, which is the difference, or even better, or 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 and the percentage change, which is EV minus ice divided by ice. Ice is internal combustion engine. On the right, SCG is showing the same thing for uh, 200 kilometers per day. So here is the interesting thing. So obviously you are getting a lot of you have a 45 percent reduction in total costs with pollution or without pollution as shown in and the absolute numbers in 1000 crores per year for 300 electric 300,000 electric cars or so 300 ele lakh electric vehicles so many thousand crores. So imports decline so here's the interesting thing imports decline by 50 percent so total embodied just one minute uh, is the audio come to rest come. People are complaining. Yeah, I just got a message. Uh, is everybody able to uh, hear uh, Dr. Rajagopal clearly, please? If you could confirm. Yeah, someone can unmute, unmute and say. Yeah. Okay, no. it's clear. It's clear. Thank you. It's clear. Okay. All right. Okay. Good to know. It was very important. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me pick it back up again. Uh, let, I know this is a very busy slide, so I want to go very slowly. Um, so there is clear reduction in uh, life cycle cost, about 50% reduction in the life cycle cost. Um, imports also declined by 50%. Uh, so the percentage numbers are more meaningful. But here's the big deal. Total government revenues declined by 87%. So the uh, the and it's essentially all the reduction in excise duty and VAT collection from avoided oil consumption. Um, jobs decline by a small number by twenty three percent, which uh, yeah it is it is reasonable. I think when people say electric vehicles increase jobs, I hope they do in the future. But we need to again. This is I'm not saying this is how it is. It will be in the future. I want to be very careful. Based on the assumptions I made. This is what I'm getting using those jobs intensities and amount of dollars or rupees of jobs lost. And I welcome uh, you know, suggestions to improve this. Uh, you can reach me uh, after this and email me. I'm happy to clarify. Um, and if you go to 200 kilometers per day, now look at the absolute numbers. EV minus I is in absolute. This is very interesting. Uh, I want to focus on the total <clears throat> government revenues. If you drive more, you are offsetting more gasoline, petrol, which means even less excise taxes and uh, even less. Uh, so the uh, government. So here's the thing. I'm saying that you should target the high usage vehicles because that's where you get more cost savings because you are using the capital more. It's a more expensive piece of capital. The more you use it, the more benefits you get. It's a basic finance 101 or economics 101, right? But uh, it also hurts the revenues more because you're you're taking out the more using vehicles. But the interesting thing is the cost savings that accrue to consumers across the life cycle is much, much more. It jumps from 6.66 on the top row in the third column, EV minus ice. It was a 6.66 thousand crore uh, reduction in uh, costs. Now it's a 13.4 it's a almost doubling when you double the driving from 100 to 200 you double it when you look at fuel exports uh, fuel uh, impo uh, fuel revenues uh, sorry annualized total government revenues that was 4.7 negative 4.7 it doesn't double it only goes up to negative 8.9 so first of all the negative 6.6 is greater than the negative is a greater savings than the negative 4.7 so you have some greater savings to consumers that if you can capture and share or you know you take it away from the consumer you can actually offset some of your losses it's very tough i don't know how the government can do that uh, uh, but it's it's it, it is it is a trade off government loses revenue but consumers and and and, and economy or, or, or uh, benefits in terms of lower cost and presumably those 
savings will be reinvested in the economy that will then lead to more spending which will lead to more tax collection so some of it might be a rebound in consumption so even though the government revenues decline there may be a rebound in consumption but here's the thing if those rebounds are not taxed as high as petrol you may not recoup all the costs so any either way uh, uh, that's that's the challenge for public finance is to how do we how do we uh, sell this or how do we actually you know make sure we how, the, if, if you know in, in economic terms this is making the pie bigger if you think of the pie getting larger the pie gets larger it becomes a redistribution question we often talk of redistribution between the rich and the poor here it's a question of redistribution between savings accruing to consumers um, and the loss to the government revenues so it's a very different kind of uh, challenge um so yeah that uh, i want to reinforce that when you target the high usage vehicles it it's it's definitely much more efficient from a policy perspective because you are taking out the more polluting and the more inefficient uh, and these people actually the people who drive more will actually get lot more uh, life cycle savings so uh, they will see more value in adopting electric vehicles they still face a high upfront cost so the policy challenge is how do we actually uh, um target those people and help them a lot of these things might people might be commercial drivers taxi drivers uh people who cannot but they can also be corporate fleets and so on so uh so i don't want to deviate too much uh from the okay uh, yeah i'll try to keep it as interesting to the trade people as possible apologies if this is not your conventional trade talk um sure my throat is getting <laughs> thank you um that's good really helpful um so here i'm showing so one thing as a, i'm a modeler and i know um i do more sophisticated modeling uh but but uh, any uh, but ultimately you know any model is an abstraction of reality and um, i think it's extremely important that we test our model as much as possible to all the assumptions we can make so so i'm i'm trish and in this case i'm i'm showing a sensitivity to uh, petrol price so what if tomorrow you know this is going to happen if we don't have a global carbon tax and there is no global government there is going to be a global carbon tax uh, and even in many countries there isn't going to be a carbon tax we are actually reducing uh, uh, consumption of um, uh, uh, fossil fuels not through a carbon tax but through uh, supporting renewables which is politically much more appealing and there's a lot of reasons why we do that uh but here is the challenge right as we if we don't impose a carbon tax as we shift away from fossil fuels fossil fuels are going to get cheaper and that is going to be a lead to a rebound in fossil fuel consumption because there is nothing keeping the fossil fuel prices high so as it gets cheaper people are going to demand more and so uh and and and, and if fossil fuels are going to fall so tomorrow if we are looking at 10 years from now 15 years from now i don't think if 50 years 50 rupees a liter is possible in the long it, it, it won't be a sustained thing in the next 10 years it, you might have episodes where it drops but it may be a thing uh, in the in the longer run i hope it falls and and then we raise it up through a carbon tax but let's say tomorrow it falls um and and it sustains at 50 rupees a liter for 2 3 4 5 6 years like after the financial crisis of 2003 or after the shale boom of the uh, 2010 2011 uh then what happens actually you know lower oil price means uh, lower benefits because petrol is cheaper so your life cycle cost savings are lower um but the government revenues uh, uh also decline right? because if it's if the our our excise taxes are all on a percentage basis so as fuel oil price so the loss from ev uh, loss from shifting to i so at 100 rupees a liter at 100 kilometers a day you lose near 4 the government loses 4.7000 crores from 300000 electric cars whereas it, in the other case it loses 2.8000 uh, crores and the, if it's 200 kilometers a day uh, it shows but the the, re, the biggest the bigger hit is we have uh, uh, look at the left column negative 2.9 and negative 2.8 the gain to the, the cost savings is offset by the loss to the government so that so you don't have much to redistribute actually so that's a very interesting uh, thing i'm just uh, take another sip i'll start coughing otherwise um okay disaggregating employment 
where are the jobs being gained and where are the jobs being lost? If you look at an at, at, at auto vehicle, at auto, uh, um, um, at a con- uh, internal combustion engine on the left, uh, there is about 17,269 jobs associated with 300,000 cars. Okay. Out of that, 11,000 is in the making of the vehicle. About, thank you. About 1,000 is in fuel. About 5,200 is in um, things. So, it's very interesting. The imports account for, fuel imports account for 50% of the life cycle cost of a vehicle. But fuel imports are only 1,000 jobs. Fuel sector jobs are only 1,000. So, here's the interesting thing, right? Their 50% is actually, we are sending out the money. The remaining 50% is value addition, but it is not creating that many jobs. Uh, so it, this is a real big problem with, with, the, with the fossil fuel oil sector uh, that I find it problematic. It's a huge wealth transfer on the one hand. At the same time, it's not creating too many jobs. It is creating jobs in maintenance. It's creating jobs in vehicle production, but it's not on the fuel side. Now, if you shift to uh, electric vehicles, um, the distribution, uh, so for ICE, distribution is 65% in, in vehicles, 6% in fuel, 30% in maintenance. For electric vehicles, it is 60% in, it's still very similar, but you have 20% in fuel because, again, it's in uh, coal and electricity, which is much more job intensive. Uh, then, so shifting from petrol, uh, oil refining to electricity will actually increase your jobs in transportation, uh, the fuel structure. So it's much more equitably distributed, 20% in ma- and maintenance declines, but more goes into uh, charging, charging infrastructure and so on. So that's very interesting. And there's a net decline. And most of the decline um, is in, uh, and most of the decline is in, um, in, in, in manufacturing, but don't go by the numbers because it's offset by maintenance. So it's a 76% decline of the loss is in auto production, but it actually uh, uh, offset by, sorry, it's offset by increase in uh, fuel. But there is a net decline. I won't sugarcoat it. There is a net decline because it's not, a lot. not a lot. It's not a lot. Also, it can be made up. It can be made up. Policy options. So now I'm going to switch to discussing the policy options. Um, so I think one clear message is switching to high usage vehicles, delivers greater cost savings. Um, government revenues will decline, but imports decline a lot too. So from a trade perspective, there is a lot more decline. So lower cost savings, uh, greater cost savings, and a lot more reduction in fuel imports. Uh, but a lot of, uh, and a slightly greater reduction in government revenues. Uh, one option I'll show, I think I have this number. Oh, I thought I had that. Um, I want to say that the, so the GST on, on the GST on, um, um, the GST subsidy, which is only 5% on electric vehicles itself amounts to if you if you, char- if you if you put a 43% GST, which is 28% plus the or 20, uh, plus for the luxury category another 15% cess, that itself amounts to four and a half lakhs of subsidy. So the government by putting a lower subsidy, uh, lower GST itself is already giving a rebate of three lakhs on electric cars. It's not explicit; it's implicit. The government is taking a loss of three lakhs on every electric car sold on the GST front. So that's a huge subsidy. Um, and uh, so one thing that the government could do is because electric vehicles are very are giving benefits in the long run, if you can find a way to not to, to maybe have a higher GST, but give a loan to, or to EV buyers that they replay, that they pay back, you can have another discussion later. So instead of giving it as a GST subsidy, you can give it a low interest loan that is recouped. That way can be that way the government can offset some of the losses from oil revenues. Um, I have a paper on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we can talk about it offline. Um, so domestic manufacturing. So this is very important. Again, um, so for the from a trade perspective, uh, if you look at the domestic manufacturing, I put up, I assumed a 30% premium on, on domestic cell manufacturing. I so essentially say whatever is the international price, I will put 30% more because India is trying to learn to make cells. We are not there yet. We need to get there. And so this is one of the big challenges for the domestic industries to invest in learning and coming up to scale and catching up with other established uh, producers because they have the benefit of 10-15 years of uh, leg up 
on us. Um, so, so if you do domestic manufacturing, it raises, so a 30% premium on sales raises the price of an electric vehicle by 66,000 rupees. Okay. Even if you say another, you know, so, and that raises the TCO by 25 paise per kilometer. So the, the view, the cost of domestic manufacturing is not very high, actually. It's only, if I put a 30% premium, it raises the cost of an electric vehicle by 66,000. Uh, life cycle uh, governments, life cycle cost savings decline because the car is costlier and the government revenues diminish uh, 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 slightly because you are collecting an import tariff. The import tariff on sales is now lost. So there is again another hit on the government, but they collect a 5% GST. So that you, you're, they collect a 5% GST on, on, uh, on domestically made sales, but they lose the 5% import tariff, which now has gone up to 12% import tariff. I think the government has raised the import tariff to 12%. So you lose 12% import tariff on imported sales, but you get a 5% GST on a slightly costly or slightly, so it more or less offsets. And that's why I said slightly uh, diminishes. One, one question here, the annualized job loss. It's so, if I'm reading it correctly, it is uh, a loss of uh, 3,945 jobs per right. year. Right. And a loss of uh, 2,355 jobs. From a domestic sale. So because domestic you're gaining 1,000 jobs in making yeah, domestic so, But So while the job loss, is reduced there is still a job loss that yeah of course in. the battery manufacturing is not that labor intensive it's high surface high-end sophisticated electronics manufacturing right electronics or electrochemicals okay uh, the percentage we need to see yeah uh, not the absolute numbers yeah percentage drop how much are this yeah the long run how this yeah. yeah yeah exactly so long run so again i want to again i think since you showed up a little later i was saying caveating it this is a short run analysis there isn't any metric model of what's going the main message i want to say this is how it, things look today we need to act to make sure we mitigate the negative benefits and we harness the positive benefits so the the point is to not take this as a given but to take that this is how things look today and and this is the facts on the ground based on the jobs intensity from a policy yes point of absolutely so so this is so I have uh, let's have a discussion there on the policy. Um, that's uh, so. So the first was target high usage vehicles. The second is domestic cell manufacturing, which you're already doing. I have one more piece to add there, but I am just showing what sort of numbers my model suggests. The third is a ZEV mandate. Uh, so oh here I have it. The GST subsidy for electric vehicle already is like four lakhs, four and a half lakhs. It's implicit. You are not writing a check. Like, you're, like in America, if I buy an electric vehicle, I get a check from the government. Essentially, my tax goes down. So it's very transparent. This is actually revenue not collected because you're giving it as a GST subsidy. But implicitly, the government is losing. If it had sold a petrol vehicle, it would have captured more GST. So we need to, we need to drill this to the automakers because the automaker companies are saying, hey, you guys are not subsidizing. No, we have to, government is providing a big subsidy. By taking a hit on GST. Out of the GST. Out of the GST. 28%. Yeah. 28% is for like a sub 8 lakh category. I think if you go above 10 lakhs, I think there is a additional cess of 15%. It goes up to 43% in the luxury class for the higher end, I think. Um, so this is at the higher end. At the lower end, it will be like 2.5, 2.9 lakhs. I'm saying this for the luxury end cars, actually. Uh, the incremental upfront cost I estimated is only 3 lakhs. Okay, so now here's the scenario. If you say that automakers, hey, you guys have to sell 10% of your cars to be electric, like the US has, uh, not US, California or other streams. I know mandates are not very popular. Subsidies everybody likes because you write a check. Mandate means it's an unfunded mandate and nobody likes mandates. But there is evidence that world over, especially in California, mandates have worked. And it has worked in a lot of other, like solar, the renewable portfolio standards and so on. So we need to look at a mandate. And it's not that we are putting a mandate without giving any carrot. So mandate is like a stick and subsidy is like a carrot. Since we are giving a nice carrot, so why not complement it with a stick? And there is theoretical evidence here. I've done a lot of work on biofuels where we've done papers showing a mandate plus subsidy is much more efficient or less uh, inefficient compared to a pure subsidy. And the reason is the mandate raises the price. In raising the price, it reduces the rebound effect on consumption. And so it's it's also it, your, your every dollar of government subsidy goes a little bit farther. 
and it also reduces the burden on the government finances because some of it you are shifting it on to the consumers and the producers. Uh, so it's not so transparent. Uh, subsidy is very transparent. A mandate, the cost of a mandate is less transparent. You don't see it. It's not very easy to quantify. It. Um, it's not a, like a, so. It's hidden in the how much consumption and production changes and prices change, which is easy to. It's not easy to show. Uh, so the impact of a mandate. So you take the three lakhs. Uh, of the extra cost and you say now every petrol cell petrol car maker has to blend essentially it's like blending fuel is blending a car for every 10 petrol cars i sell or every nine petrol cars i sell one of my cars has to be a electric car so then the weighted if that burden falls on the auto maker his cost of an ice vehicle will go up by 31000 so a, car, a petrol car which costs 10 lakhs will now cost 10 lakh and 31000 because he has to eat the increased cost of selling an electric vehicle. It's not a huge burden. It's like a 3%. But I'm sure there will be political opposition to it from them. Uh, so that should, but, but then I think we have to say, hey, you know, we are losing. The government is losing 3 lakhs. You can eat up surely 30,000. I think that's the way it has to be presented. Um, otherwise, I think the industry is going to oppose tooth and nail anything. Uh, that's the challenge to figure out for policymakers. How do we sell it? And we have to be very careful. I mean, we are not talking 100% mandate. We should say start small, 5%, 10%, and build it up so that it's 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 sort of manageable. I think the challenge is we should not say like okay, banning it by 10 years that doesn't sound good. You start slow uh, and backload it. So tradable permits can so and if you make it a tradable system, if you make say that automakers can trade it, it can further reduce compliance cost and so on. And and the interesting thing about mandates is it provides certainty for investments across the supply chain. Now everybody knows I have to sell this many cars. Right now we have a subsidy, but you don't know who is going to uptake it. You don't know how many cars to make. With a mandate, there is a clear signal. Okay, there is a market now for X thousand cars. Let's make investments on it. Um, okay, this is okay. I want to spend some time on this, uh, and and here is where the trade team can sort of give me a hard time if you want. Uh, this I call this idea tradable certificates of domestic content. Uh, so clearly we already have the PLI scheme, right? The PLI scheme is one mechanism which focuses on increasing domestic supply. So it's a supply side thing. You're investing in manufacturing and so on. Um, here I, the theory suggests that mandates plus subsidies have some advantages over pure subsidies, essentially for public finances and from an environmental perspective also, it, it, it raises the cost of consuming the polluting stuff. It brings down the, so you have some benefits. So the idea I had was I presented this to Badri uh, uh, was like you know uh, and and you know could we extend this idea of tradable permits to imports um, again people who work daily with the WTO rules and stuff can tell me hey this won't fly if this is violating um, or so on so the idea is to extend the idea of tradable permits to uh, imports for EVs. So essentially set a targets industry or sector wide domestic content on OEMs. So the PLI scheme is on manufacturing. Just like a mandate on OEMs to sell cars, we can think of a mandate that okay, across the industry for electric vehicles, we want 75% to be domestic content value. If you look at the final value of the car, 75% of the car has to, value has to be domestic. Um, and you set an industry-wide target and then say, okay, somebody can have a 50% domestic content, somebody can have 0%, somebody can have 25%, somebody can have 90%, but you guys all trade among each other. So anybody who goes above this target, I have to have, let's say you set the target is 50% domestication. If somebody has 70% domestic content, they have some extra credits now. So they have about one lakh worth of extra domestic content, which they can sell as a certificate. So somebody, let's say, okay, I, I'm an, uh, uh, just to take an example, one guy makes cars in India, the other guy imports batteries. So the import guy may say, oh, I would rather not buy a domestic cell. I want to continue my imports, but I can offset it by buying permits, by selling my, uh, by buying permits from a domestic cell maker or a domestic. So, so this way, actually, it also creates it. So just like you have a supply, it creates a demand for permits from the bottom up. So, so essentially, this is simply extending the idea of trading to, we have, we have talked of trading of pollution rights. This is a trading of import content. So this is one area, I think, which, uh, I don't know, this might be a crazy idea. Uh, an expert on trade may say this is, this is 
this is uh, yeah obviously this is just extending trading but it won't fly uh, it's too complicated there may be transaction cost uh, i don't i think those are not the major concerns my major concern is one uh, is this falling foul of any wto requirements on domestic content um, i know the pli scheme was designed very cleverly so that it doesn't avoid it doesn't say uh, so uh, i don't know i'm not a trade expert uh, so uh, that that's that's but i do think something like this can help reduce the cost of um, uh, higher cost of domestic sales um, and a sort of increase competition in in demand for domestically manufactured because ultimately you want the oems to buy domestically made sales um, while there are manufacturers they need a market as well so uh, this can be something that can make oems also uh, work with um, Uh, so tradable so this is what i call tradable certificates of domestic content uh, it can be based on kilowatt hours it can be based on value addition you can index it to um, um uh, i don't think per vehicle makes sense you can make this in tradable across sectors so you have a you have you can have it to you have two wheelers three wheelers four wheelers and buses and trucks uh and you can have it Uh, you, you can have them trade across sectors so that we can specialize more in um, four wheelers and three wheelers and or maybe we can specialize more in two wheelers and three wheelers today and four wheelers can actually just buy offsets but in the long run then four wheelers can also then so it's a way where by which you can reduce the cost on one sector in the short run while we build up capacity in that sector so so you can make it tradable across firms you can make it tradable across sectors and i had a even more fanciful idea that you make it tradable even with the electricity sector you need storage for electricity so you can actually one broad scheme i know now you have to look into working with different ministries and different the departments the more you extend this across sectors and industries the more it becomes like a carbon tax exactly but within the but but it's, it's not carbon based it's domestic content based it's um and uh, but this is more motivated on the imports right you can the batteries you can have a look at the uh, european union's border uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism i think cba and i think it's called carbon border adjustment. that is explicitly tied to carbon though that you have tied to carbon yes that is explicitly tied to carbon but that is also uh, i think sector specific yes uh, so uh, that that is something which you can look at as you refine this idea further uh because uh, the pli scheme is very specific it's focused on increasing domestic production yeah. it is not it, it does not concern itself with exports or imports that's, that's focused, the good thing that's the good thing that's why it is not it's focused specifically exactly. on domestic production now the thing is i mean this idea has to be explored much further it really does have to be explored much further but uh any any uh, any pol- any investment policy or any mm-hmm. industrial policy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that uh, that discriminates between uh, imports yeah. or that is explicitly tied, tied to, to trade. trade that is explicitly tied to ta- trade yeah will probably yeah. be a foul so, of uh, absolutely That's now the challenge. this has to be explored further Yeah. it has to be explored one but one carve out could be like one exception could be if you do government consumption but then it's a small share it's like for, for public like consumption is a now now you're getting far to think you'll have to now refer to the actual legal texts yeah yeah okay, okay. so i do i do realize that this could fall foul of that that's the only challenge is but this is um so, uh, so one is my limited understanding is clearly this is not about exports uh, this is about domestic consumption but it does It, 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 it does differentiate imports from domestic, so that's going to be the challenge. Um, so, but anyway, so that 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 that's one crazy idea I had. As a, I mean, I was wearing my environmental economics hat, where the real innovation in one of the biggest innovations in environmental economics has been the idea of extending trading of goods to the trading of bads. Right? I'm extending the idea of trading of. Uh, Thinking this from the point of view of sustainable goals, like if India can pitch it in some way, like you know there are sustainability goals, and we have to cut down on our carbon emissions to see it this way. Whether we coach, you know, yeah, play with this, this has to be explored. Yeah, the I it's I yeah I the linkage to say that 
we are producing uh, we are demanding this because we are clean if it's if it was cleaner if it was completely say for instance the imported carbon imported batteries had high pollution content whereas the domestic batteries have a low pollution content then you could probably index it to the carbon content then that would be legitimate i'm not sure you will get a big benefit in, the, in that i mean the carbon intensity of batteries is important it's not to be ignored but it's it's in the big scheme of things it's not a big deal uh there could be other things like sourcing uh from certain places uh yeah so that's a big topic to explore yeah somewhat similar to battery performance is even great scheme that we have so it's about energy efficiency okay so we have critical components and then uh, it's like a cap it's basically you're suggesting a cap and on that basis yeah uh, extra if you go right. about the gap in that can be created right. so we have some of scheme in the energy efficiency part which is going back uh, i just wanted to know what will be the units of the rate particular yeah again that how do you index it if it's going to be every uh 10000 rupees of domestic content is one certificate something like that right so essentially you say that if you are if if you it has to be tied to uh, it has to be tied to um uh, uh rupees the certificate value because it's if we're talking of like you know domestic content in terms of value addition which has to be in rupees so it has to be say okay every 100000 every 1 lakh of domestic uh content is one certificate so if your car is uh, 10 lakhs and out of that uh, essentially uh, all 10 lakhs is domestic then we have 10 certificates and the, your obligation is to have at least 8 certificates per car so if i have if i have to have 8 certificates it's a 80% domestic content the remaining two two certificates is trade is I, i have excess which i can trade it's just that amount yeah yeah you can do it with kilowatt hours of batteries if you want we can do it with so kilowatt hours of batteries i can also do that i if i have a 30 kilowatt hour battery and i say that my battery uh, and so you can say if you have it have 80% domestic battery content then you can say okay out of 30 uh, 22.5 uh, yeah 24 kilowatt hours have to be domestic but if i have entire 30 kilowatt hours as domestic i have 6 kilowatt hours of certificates to trade so whichever is sensible or simpler we can do that Yeah, the challenge is going to link it to uh, how do you how do you sell it? How do you sell it as a uh, you have the PLI scheme, which is a very good scheme. I hope that works. Uh, and I, I've read articles uh, um, say that this has been well designed. I also have read articles op eds criticizing it. I I don't know. I'm not the expert there, but it seems like it's been well designed to make sure it's about domestic production and strategic importance rather than. creating uh yeah subsidized although if you see a lot of times in trade a lot of people who have cost advantages today are because they have been subsidized by the industry uh 10 15 years back and today they have gotten to a stage where they have cost competitive so that is a whole topic by itself huh that is a whole topic by itself yes <laughs> so i i okay this is a spreadsheet i won't go into to show i basically set up a simple spreadsheet it's too much to go now uh where i have like you know simple toy model showing i have four types of companies two wheelers four wheelers uh light duty trucks and heavy duty trucks and i do some tradable permit scheme here it's too much for now um so i just want to conclude you know in the interest of time that you know evs present trade offs between lower life cycle cost pollution and imports uh on the one hand there is clearly import benefits even with domestic uh, even with imported battery cells there is a clear benefit because of india's high dependence on oil imports um uh but i know that you know not all imports are equal in trade now the trade from certain countries are problem <laughs> so uh, so but aggregate imports do decline uh you may be reducing imports from friendly countries and increasing imports from unfriendly countries and so on but that's not for me to say but uh, there is a reduction in net imports and trade balance definitely improves from that from electric vehicles um uh government revenues decline this is a big challenge because the importance of tax revenues from there was a very interesting paper uh, by two economists i think um uh, it was an imf imf working paper uh, i think uh, dr lavish bandari and um uh, dr dwivedi just came out very interesting paper showing the importance of 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 oil gas and coal revenues for india's finances it's a very interesting paper 
Interesting. Um, that shows uh, it's sort of very consistent. And I, I, I just I discovered the paper just last week, and it was nice to see that sort of my numbers sort of come close, at least not often assumptions of GST and so on. Um, focusing on high usage vehicles will maximize. Uh, so, uh, so that's the challenge for the government is to balance those things and redistribute or you know, make sure that sort of uh, the government finances are made whole uh, and it doesn't suffer because you do use those money for important things. Focusing on high usage vehicles will maximize cost savings and import reduction, but will entail a slightly bigger reduction in government revenues, but the magnitude of cost savings and import reduction grows faster. The rate at which you save on cost and the rate at which you reduce imports grows faster than the rate at which revenues decline. So there is a room to sort of, uh, but it's a difficult thing to um, just lastly, I think you know this is uh, we do work on electric trucking. Again, this being Niti, you guys are obviously at the forefront of thinking about things that probably industry or other sectors of government may not be thinking ahead uh, or right now looking at. And so I, I heard that this is you know if, if you know this is the right place to sort of pitch like you know things we should be looking at going forward, which is like for instance electric trucking, uh, which we have done some work. We are bringing out a report. Um, uh, uh, just it's already it's almost written up. I'm just waiting to get some critical eyes on it. But essentially, you know, looking purely at electric trucking, and I think that will be a very big deal for imports uh, because of the amount of oil consumption. If you see, about 70% of all our petrol, uh, all our oil consumption is for diesels, and that's 90% of diesel is for trucking, or 85% is for trucking. So it's extremely important, and it's sort of very complementary. Because if you want to really reduce oil, you cannot just reduce petrol. You also have to reduce diesel. And I know we are looking at hydrogen, uh, but um, you know I think it is time to also look at electric trucking. If you if you want something ten years from now, you need electric to look at it now. Trucking as in the truck has a EV. It's an electric truck, heavy duty, truck, heavy duty electric truck. I think this is the time to start looking at it. If you want something ten years down the road, these are huge investments that need to happen today. And so, but this this, this is the time to talk start talking about it and put targets. So I can talk about it offline, but that's all I sort of had. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to take questions and yeah. Yeah, I, so I, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is Amit Verma. Uh, so thank you for Hi. such a great presentation. Hi. So um, see the number of vehicles which you have said that uh, we are going to change. So it becomes a very specific niche like uh, because of the uh, range anxiety in the electric vehicles, we can't go for a replacement of inter-city uh, vehicles right now. I mean, it has to be an intra-city vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the range which we need for them to become economical, like 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers for a day, would, would kind of limit us to commercial vehicles in metro yeah. at this point of time. Like yeah. high, tier 2 cities, we hardly have like 10, 12, 13 kilometers, 30 kilometers per day maximum. So the replacement cost right now is uh, is kind of high. Like if you look at Nexon, a good example where you have a petrol version as well as a electric version, uh, where the cost is kind of base version of Nexon is double the cost. Uh, the economics doesn't work out for a uh, for a person domestic uh, domestic user very well. So uh, when we talk about the numbers, it'll be good to have an estimate. I mean, what kind of uh, numbers we are looking at at replacement in next. Uh, five years um, that can make an interesting read sorry just the last sentence could you repeat i lost the last sentence yeah yeah no i was saying that it would be interesting to look at the numbers also like uh, looking at the estimates of numbers what we are looking at uh, uh, given the constraints we have because yeah. of electric vehicle ring uh, range anxiety Absolutely. and the limits of uh, yeah. so how what kind of numbers we are looking at in next two years five years uh, yeah you know, for replacement yeah, so so I agree completely with everything you said. Absolutely, range anxiety is one of the number one factors today. Um, and in fact, um, uh, my earlier work uh, has been all about saying actually the governments have done enough for vehicles. It's time we focus more on infrastructure because I I think pe the rational people. I mean, upfront cost is always an important factor, but as much subsidy as you give to bring the cost down. People will not buy it if they cannot charge it. So at the, on the margin today, what you need more of is uh, more investments in charging infrastructure and less in the form of subsidies. And um, if you did that, 
and you focused on commercial vehicles. The thing about commercial is they have deep pockets. They they don't have such short term planning as a private household might, you know. So the benefit of focusing on commercial vehicles is one, they use a lot. They don't need as much of subsidies as they need good infrastructure to run their business. So if you focus more on and, and, if, and, and investing in charging infrastructure is cheaper than giving you huge rebates on vehicles. So um, my policy, uh, my humble policy suggestion would be that if we can impress upon whoever needs to do this to do more infrastructure at this point, um, because that will automatically help uh, adoption, drive adoption once people see that this can be charged. Um, and other, your other points are well taken. My cost estimate comes out as 3 lakhs over a, a conventional, if Tata Nexon is being priced at double, I don't know what is their pricing strategy. I also don't know how, um, yeah, so is it justified by current battery prices? I don't think, maybe they're trying to, see, I don't want to cast aspersions, but I don't know, in a sense, if auto companies say, we are pricing it, uh, see, we are priced it, nobody's buying it, it's a way for the auto companies to also say, see, nobody wants the car. Then the government is forced to double down, uh, forced to back down and give more subsidy. It could be a strategic thing. Uh, and automakers we know have some market power. So my my calculations from bottom up suggest if you can get the international battery price at $150, which today is actually less than that, and you put a 30% premium, still I'm coming. So why are you so costly? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have the in, inside information on the auto industry, but it is also possible that there is strategic behavior there. There's another question. Can we look at sales consumption elasticity with respect to total prices and scenarios where there is good charging infra and low charging infra? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, the next step is to have a more parametric model have embedded in some kind of behavioral model with assumptions like you know a very simple price elasticity of supply and demand i used to build a lot of these kind of models for biofuels uh, where precisely this kind of models we have built very simple models three by two sector by two sector with some very basic price i think that's a good suggestion um, what is preventing me from doing it is actually not having uh, uh, you know, as an academic, I rely on grad students to do a lot of the modeling for me. And so um, at this point, not having a funded project with a student to do this is only the barrier. But I think certainly something with the, somebody, anyone with the resources interested, I'm happy to collaborate with. Uh, but that, that's a good point. I think that's the natural next step. If you want to do this a little bit more longer run and look at how things will change behaviorally, um, that's the next step to have these kind of behavioral parameters in the model. Reach out. <laughs> sure. Uh, Ms. Garima has a question. Yeah, Ms. Garima, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Deepak, uh, for the presentation. Very informative. Uh, just wanted to also uh, uh, ask you, like, for example, now we have estimated, uh, you have estimated the uh, cost, uh, like, you know, basically the pollution reduction uh, associated with EVs, but could you also have? Uh, included the um, you know the uh, cost of uh, like the 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 uh, avoided cost of uh, pollution abatement as well as the pollution uh, avoided cost of like, say the uh, the health impacts yeah, yeah, associated yeah, yeah. with uh, you know uh, so I think that would have yeah, made a yeah. even better case for EVs yeah um, for the government as well yes and uh, also just uh, with regard to the electrification of uh, freight transport that you were basically saying uh, I mean I've heard that uh, you know the uh, barriers to electrifying the heavy duty freight transport mm -hmm. is the large size of the battery yes. and also the weight of the battery okay and uh, like you know the the yeah. barriers associated with uh, also some of the barriers also include that uh, you know um, for example the recharging time yes yes that yes. would also okay. matter Absolutely. a lot when it comes to electrifying so heavy freight uh, is like considered as a hard to abate hard to, sorry hard to abate also basically sector in india so Absolutely. what is the viewpoint point on that okay so on the on the on the on the first point it's a very good point i didn't emphasize i mean um, emphasize pollution enough um, because I think for me, the environmental benefits are a given, uh, and I would like to reinforce that even as people say with a, with a, with a coal heavy electric mix, it's not giving, I mean, that's something people who actually have either not a complete understanding 
uh, and just simply repeat what some people say that you know even with with a cold mix there is benefits maybe not as much as it you would with a so with a solar or wind heavy uh, electric mix on the pollution cost i i i put a 50 dollar per ton carbon dioxide cost that's why i show total life cycle cost savings with and without uh, internalizing the carbon cost but i have nothing there for health benefits which are very big um especially in urban congested urban areas where electric vehicles provide a lot of health benefits by taking out um but um the health benefits are actually greater trucking than for uh, than that of course it, it's better than uh, petrol but the uh, petrol cars uh, emit some you know uh, nox and some this thing uh, but the biggest benefit of electrics for public health will come from removing trucking that uses diesel and since this is not a diesel paper i really uh so there is i'm underestimating the benefits environmental benefits but again the focus of my talk here was to draw attention to the the imports the government revenues and jobs uh uh and 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 i the electric the case for electric vehicles is still strong if you tell I me mean, it will be a little bit stronger of course but it's still very strong on the second point um uh is uh, on, on on trucking we in this report that we will release soon uh, we actually pay very careful attention to the net increase in weight of the truck the weight of the truck goes up by something around 5 to 10% so i won't sugar coat it it goes up by 5% to 10% which means you have that much less room for payload which is what earns you money so it's not a big problem in america we looked at statistics where America only about 70% of the trucks actually 70% of the trips are actually full load there is huge room they are not packed to the brim or to the hilt like when i see when i go come to india and i see trucks man they are overflowing there is like literally no room they are probably all way overweight and so it's a more important a concern for india that we don't pay a penalty in terms of weight so right now there is a 5 to 10% hit on the weight of the truck so if you do you know within city or you know so so at least trips where you have some room you can do that um but it's another interesting question is do the cost savings we have substantial cost savings in the life cycle so do the cost savings offset the reduction in the payload so you need to calculate per kg of load per kilometer how much you're losing revenue and per kg per kilometer how much you're saving in fuel cost if the latter is greater then there is a case to uh still do an electric truck okay uh that's first response the second is the charging time which is also a very good question if you you need you are going to need extreme fast charging even 50 kilowatts might not suffice you would probably need something in the range of 125 to 250 kilowatts if you want to do commercial heavy duty trucking the benefit from india is the truck speeds are smaller and the distance so it's a trade off you can oversize your battery and do more frequent charging or you can undersize your battery uh sorry oversize your battery and do less frequent charging and or you can undersize your the uh, vice versa uh, um undersize your battery and do more frequent charging so those are some scenarios we can explore um so I mean, but yeah uh, there are challenges but uh, the point we're making in that report is we need to start so, now there is learning by doing no there is you shouldn't wait for like an i, I joke it's a very trivial joke i mean you had to have iphone 1 iphone 2 to get to iphone 13 you don't jump to iphone 13 so we have to start with electric truck 1.0 before we get to electric truck 13.0 so most probably we pick ups in the short run yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah. definitely we should this is not an easy thing yes. and uh, if it was easy it would have happened and this is precisely the role of policy is to take on the difficult challenges so uh, mr chirag you have a question uh, yes uh thank you for the amazing presentation firstly sir uh, so my question is rather broad and um doesn't necessarily target the ev trucking part but it's rather that you talked about the environmental consequences now it might be different in the united states or in the west but when we take the case of india our energy makeup like the energy sector in our country is not as i feel well developed when it comes to using renewables or uh, nuclear power and in the long run if we go with a hypothetical scenario that with the enthusiasm that india is going into the ev market our dependence on these non renewable and environmentally non friendly resources would increase 
in which I, I, I kind of feel that EVs, although most definitely a thing of the future and everybody needs to embrace, India is, uh, the energy sector is not going in for the revolution with the same uh, momentum as the vehicles. So what is your take on that? Like, do you think that so, we, yeah, yes, sir, please go ahead. Yeah, so, so I think you raise an important question. I mean, I, work with colleagues who are working very closely I, i'm i'm a, i have an affiliation with the faculty uh, as a faculty scientist with the lawrence berkeley lab i know i have i have colleagues who are working very closely with um, and there's a long history of you know close working relationship with, uh, uh, with the ministry of um, um, uh, mnre with the power sector and so on and i and and i think they are it seems like there's a lot that is happening so i'm not an expert on the electricity sector itself but it seems like we have, um, you know, we have ambitious targets to uh, increase. And it seems like we are, you know, we, we, we came close to our target for 2022. Um, and India today is the second largest, sec India adds the most amount of, so second most amount of solar every year. So, um, and uh, uh, we also, and I said, we already have a lot of benefits, even with the, a dirtier mix, there is a strong case for electrics. So, um, yeah, we need to add more uh, renewables, but but I, I think there is, like, we shouldn't wait for more renewables to come because there is a lot, these are long changes that take a lot of time. We need to build up capacity. There's a lot of learning that needs to happen. So waiting for electricity mix to clean up is, is often something that people that have a vested interest on elect, against electric vehicles often bring up, or at least even, even if they don't, it's probably a, uh, um, incomplete understanding. I would say, you know, we should keep doing this and pursue that as well. I mean, that's, I don't have a better answer than that. Uh, we have, I think, a question in the chat, if you can just look at it. I don't know if you've answered that. Yeah, uh, that has been answered. Uh, so I think uh, in the interest of time, I think we can uh, 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 end, uh, you know, uh, complete the uh, yeah. lecture. No, uh, it was really wonderful. Uh, it was really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 12 o'clock in the night, 12 o'clock. It's like uh, <laughs> it's going into the next day no. and attending a presentation for two days, actually. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it was really wonderful uh, hearing from you and uh, really uh, thought provoking thoughts here. Um, uh, you know, uh, firstly, uh, on the discussion that you also brought up and from the from the audience also came up about the uh the you know the uh imp the impact that can happen outside the sector also right like the yeah. health impact and the yeah. uh, the, the extra environmental impact and the, the, the cost savings that you mentioned the cost savings that can result in greater consumption of other commodities and you know, the, the economy would impact that can all these things can uh in the fact yeah, you need a general model for that. You need a, if, you, if you can do a, if you can put it into a CG kind of framework, which you you guys yeah, absolutely, about. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what I'm saying is basically uh, already even with your exercise, it's it's already a very attractive proposition. Like going for electric is actually already good. And once we take into account all these general equilibrium effects, it's it's going to be even even uh, more positive. Yeah. So that, that is one thing. And the second thing is also about the. Uh, the, the trade aspect that you mentioned that is quite interesting, like uh, Vishnu also mentioned, it's good to explore it further. Uh, as far as I can see, uh, you know, uh, the local content requirements are not uh, uh, not prohibited. They, they are allowed mm -hmm. uh, and there are some exemptions for uh, allowing them, like uh, particularly if you look, look at uh, Article 20G, mm -hmm. and uh, which I think is what uh, Aparna was raising about the sustainable development uh, environmental aspects and so on. So if you can link it to that, it can be allowed. But it requires a lot of discussion, like you know, legal uh, 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 interpretation is uh, required here. But it's a very uh, uh, genuine idea. Okay. Uh, I, I've uh, seen some uh, work on this actually on renewable energy and LCR and you know, local control wow. requirements. This is something people have thought about, and I, I'll also share that with you. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, and also on the trucks, actually, I recently a uh, company uh, in in uh, which is based in NCR, uh, National Capital Region, and I think in Faridabad, they they approached me and they they, they have uh, um, they have already been producing electric trucks. 
So it's already uh, been uh, uh, in in the process, and uh, uh, so so that's definitely the future. So I think that's that's great that you mentioned about that as well. So all the the other policy ideas you mentioned are are, are quite interesting, and I'm sure our uh, uh, other colleagues and uh, team members also benefited a lot from it. Uh, maybe we can continue the conversation and uh, yeah. uh, probably do some more research on it. Uh, together and again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deepak, thank for you. coming thank here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Badri. I know it's very late. I really appreciate this opportunity and thanks to everybody. Wonderful questions and really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll and this this video will be also posted on uh, YouTube. So uh, yeah. anyone anyone who is interested who could not join today okay. can also do that later. Yeah. Hopefully, it won't get me fired. <laughs> <laughs>